Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to um, welcome to the, the History Center. The Point Roberts Historical Society welcomes you to commemorate the 175th anniversary of the signing of the Treaty of Washington, which determined the international boundary between the 49 along the 49th parallel. It is this treaty which created Point Roberts as an American exclave. As we commemorate the signing of the treaty, we pause to acknowledge the Coast Salish people whose presence on this peninsula predates the Treaty of Washington by thousands of years. Our speaker this afternoon did extensive research in writing his 2017 Point Roberts backstory. He is constantly updating his research as new info comes to light. He is a fourth generation Whatcom County resident. Please welcome our own Mark Swenson. Hi everyone. Thanks for coming out to our birthday celebration. 175 years as an exclave, Point Roberts has been. And boy, do we feel it, right? Very <laughs> tangible evidence of this treaty that we live in every single day. Um, you know the, those birthday cards you can buy where it's what happened the year you were born or you can buy the newspaper the day you were born? Um, let's, let's start there, shall we? Um, so what happened in 1846? Well, the Liberty Bell got its crack in 1846. Um, Neptune was discovered by some German guys. Um, if you were tempted to plant a flag in 1846 here in Point Roberts uh, to mark the fact that this became U.S. territory, it would have 29 flags because Iowa had just been admitted to the Union. Um, 29 flag, star flag is the weird one because it has a kind of a short row of stars there. If you were inclined then to send a postcard to someone and say, hey, I'm on this exclave and uh, this crazy new territory, um, well, that would be a problem because the United States hadn't yet issued postage stamps in 1846. First U.S. postage stamp came out the following year in 1847. And um, that wouldn't have done you much good anyway because Point Roberts didn't have a post office and for 50 more years until 1897, um, just down the street here in the Waters store, um, about where the Julius Realty building is or so. Um, California was still Mexico and Alaska was still Russia uh, and would be for 21 more years. So um, our history goes back quite a ways. Now, um, you're going to get a twofer here today. Not only is this coming Tuesday, the 175th anniversary of Point Roberts becoming an exclave of the Treaty of Washington, today, June 12th, is the 229th anniversary of George Vancouver naming Point Roberts and coming ashore at Lily Point. <coughs> Right? And Archibald Menzies writes in the journals of the Vancouver Expedition about them walking through the, the six longhouses at the Coast Salish village at Lily Point Park, um, capable of housing four to five hundred people. And they marveled at the big beams that formed the roof line, the lengthwise roof line of these six longhouses, and just marveled at the engineering of how those got 14 feet in the air. Now, the U.S. and Britain were sharing what was called Oregon Country or the Columbia District um, since 1818, right? It was uh, joint territory, along with the Coast Salish, who were here, of course, as well. That happened well into the 1840s, uh, but as early as 1824, the U.S. had started to advocate for the 49th parallel to be the boundary. The 49th parallel was already the boundary um, to the Rocky Mountains, and then it was joint territory west of the Rockies. Um, and the U.S. long had sought the 49th parallel as that border. Um, but it, they, there were maps of Point Roberts at the time, but the U.S. wanted to know a little bit more exactly where would this 49th parallel line hit? What exactly was there? They had a decent idea from, from Vancouver's maps. Um, but the U.S. Navy sent Charles Wilkes here five years before the treaty, half a decade before, in 1841. Charles Wilkes is sent um, as the first U.S. exploration north of the Columbia. Uh, Lewis and Clark had, had been out in the Columbia in 1804, etc. 
Um, and Wilkes comes with six ships here in May 1841. He went to other places as well. He went, It was a big global expedition, but um, he came to the Salish Sea primarily to uh, aid in the upcoming negotiations with Britain on where this border was going to be. And he was commanded to map every shoal, and that he did. Uh, many places that we know of today uh, in Washington bear names from Charles Wilkes. Uh, Elliott Bay, Bainbridge Island being a couple notable ones. And the specimens that they were gathering on this expedition, in part, formed the basis of the new collection of the Smithsonian Institution. So Charles Wilkes um, is sent here primarily to look you know, at what is here, but also where that 49th parallel hits the water. What is there? What would be within the US territorial claim as they're preparing for these negotiations? And so where Charles Wilkes chooses to spend his time, um, I think is quite illuminating. Let's take a look here. So the first place that um, Wilkes goes, and kind of the first place, the 49th parallel, if you're bringing it down from the Rockies towards the sea, the first place it hits salt water is in Sami Samiamu Bay. And so Wilkes spends a full half day just in that little cove between White Rock and Blaine, right, that we see when we're waiting in line at the Peace Arch to cross the border, uh, if we remember what that's like. Um, half a day in Semiamu Bay, um, then they spend three days down in the San Juan Islands. Okay, that's a lot of emphasis, three days to have uh, the Navy looking at where the channels might be that could form an international boundary. All right, three days there. Two days on the Fraser River, right? They wanted to understand that whole delta and all the different arms of the Fraser River. They were hoping, really hoping that one of those arms of the delta would be below the 49th parallel, right? They couldn't tell from Vancouver's maps because Vancouver missed the Fraser River. He totally sailed right on by, didn't even see the river. So that was of a, a tremendous um, interest to them. And they went up the river to Fort Langley. Okay, how long did they spend at Point Roberts then, in comparison, right? Because that's the last place the 49th parallel touches land before it goes into the Strait of Georgia. They spent eight days here, eight days at Point Roberts, right? So that really signifies how interested they were, how much that was important in their mission to understand what would be in the U.S. territorial claim if 49 degrees was what they could negotiate for with Britain. So I think that says a lot. Um, it's a little washed out, but that is the first U.S. map of Point Roberts. Right, that's Wilkes's map. Question in the back? Yeah, I, excuse my, my ignorance, but how do you determine the 49th parallel in 1841? How did they do that? So the question is, how did they determine the 49th parallel? Um, so these are crude instruments, sextants, and looking at the stars, this kind of thing. Okay. Yep. Um, so this is Charles Wilkes' map. Um, it's a little blurred out, but um, it, it looks like Point Roberts, right? You can even see the topography. They've drawn in some hills. If I zoom in, um, we can see they've written Point Roberts, 1841, half a decade before the treaty. And it says Point Roberts, 48 degrees, 58, right? So they are uh, showing that it is below the 49th parallel. Question over here? Yes, I guess the question is, is that map in the book? Uh, in my book. In your book. It is not. But it is in the History Center, correct? Um, it is. It's, I have a YouTube video where it's in, and this will become a YouTube video. So you'll be able to see it a little bit better, and, and you'll be able to inspect that closer. Here's a close-up of Lily Point, um, and the detail, um, when you can see it properly, um, you can see the, the cliffs. You can see the Lily Point lowlands. You can see the, the reef coming out from Lily Point. And um, there are all, all kinds of numbers here. These numbers are the soundings and fathoms that they're taking um, along the reef, along all the tidelands, along South Beach and Crystal Beach, and uh, up along the east side um, to Maple Beach. So they're being very, very precise in exactly what is here, what is its potential, what is its value, um, and understanding exactly what is south of the 49th parallel. 
Let's talk about those eight days. I think this is fascinating. Um, they have logs and journals, and it's fun to go day by day uh, with Charles Wilkes at Point Roberts in 1841. So it starts with 4th of July. They're anchored off Point Roberts, haven't yet come ashore, and this is the first U.S. celebration of the 4th of July um, in Point Roberts, uh, July 4th, 1841. The next day, July 5th, they come ashore, um, and they're camped probably about 300 meters due south of here um, on the Thule, on the beach. Uh, they have dinner, um, and they accidentally set the Thule grasses on fire. So this is, they've created a wildfire, they're beat tired, and they have to now put out a wildfire um, along the shoreline. And they didn't mind. Right? Hard work, but they said the smoke got rid of the mosquitoes because they're camped on a muddy tidal basin. Can you imagine the mosquitoes in July? Right? There's no law mention in the logs of July 6th. I believe they were probably still here, but I don't count it as the eight days. Maybe they went somewhere else. But on the 7th, 7th is a big day in, in the Point Roberts uh, history. July 7th, 1841, quote from the U.S. Navy, found that 49 degrees north passes through Point Roberts, right? So they have now conclusively determined and wrote it down for all uh, history to know that this will be an exclave if we end up successfully negotiating 49 degrees north. Um, and then they're kind of bummed about Fraser's River. They continue to say, uh, but Fraser's River is not within our territorial claim. Um, but they're interested in that. So the next two days, they leave Point Roberts, and they spend two days on the Fraser River Delta, go upriver to the Hudson's Bay Company Fort at Fort Langley. There they see the salmon, hundreds and hundreds of salmon salting in barrels, and they're told, all this salmon, this comes from Point Roberts. And so the very next day, July 10th, they head right back to Point Roberts with a newfound appreciation of this place and they spend 17 hours mapping Point Roberts on July 10th. Um, quote from the Navy, um, anchored again at Point Roberts, um, visited, a number of Indians visited us. Right, so a big, big day now that they really know we gotta understand this place, because this is a place um, of significance. And then on the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th, they're just continually making measurements around Lily Point, Maple Beach, understanding um, the, the tidelands. On the 14th, another quote, still at anchor at Point Roberts. Um, we're taking measurements on shore and we still have four boats out surveying the tidelands. Um, they do not see the fact that this is going to be an exclave as a problem. Nowhere in the journals, nowhere in the logs do they say maybe we should you know, zigzag the line. This is just not ever seen in their, uh, in their documents. Um, they actually view it quite inclusively as, you know, this is part of the claim that we're here to uh, measure. Um, and so the, the logs are very kind of factual there. The journals then get a little more descriptive and, and they talk about the significance that they see of Point Roberts. Um, they started the morning of July 4th in Birch Bay, and the Lummies brought them here in their canoes, escorted them to Point Roberts as the most important uh, place that they need to visit um, and really see um, where there's uh, you know, an important piece of land. They described the salmon as very fine, uh, the nicest they've seen, and they've already been throughout most of the Salish Sea, um, and they talk about the abundance of the salmon. They also talk about the soil and the fruits that they're seeing here, and they're really describing a place of abundance. Um, they see it as a natural part of the United States. They see it as part of the territorial claim. They view it as part of the mainland. We kind of describe us as being detached from the mainland, but they didn't, the border wasn't there yet. And, you know, compared to a San Juan Island or a, a Southern Gulf Island, you know, this is mainland territory that they think is valuable. Um, and they really describe a connectedness that it has, a natural connectedness uh, to Drayton Harbor at Blaine and uh, Birch Bay. And they, they show on the map soundings that they have taken all the way across uh, to what we call the mainland to really show um, that it's navigable to get here and they, this is a trading route. And then they also see this as strategic versus the British. Um, so. 
the the thing that they just keep coming back to over and over and over again is that um, Point Roberts is near the mouth of the Fraser River. And they felt the mouth of the Fraser River was going to be really, really important. They foresaw that a big city would be built there, um, as, as did happen. And so they found it really, really important that the U.S. have territory as close to the mouth of that river as possible um, to get in on that action, um, to be here kind of near and among the Hudson's Bay Company forts and really describe the kind of development, not individual trapper-based, but more the potential for cities and communities um, for the type of de development that they were tasked to explore. So they're really describing, um, this is not a, a, a weird thing that this would be an exclave, they're describing this as, yeah, this is a place we ought to own. Um, and that is what Wilkes ends up reporting back to the U.S. government. Uh, he returns to Washington, D.C. within 20 days. He has maps and an atlas and his logs delivered to the U.S. Senate, the U.S. State Department. And um, the diplomats kind of take over from there and they start formulating how they are going to describe their negotiating position with Britain. And they start to write this down. And so you have these two dudes on the top right who are doing this, right? Um, you have Edward Everett in the Oval. Uh, he's the U.S. ambassador to, to Britain. And then you have Daniel Webster on the, to the right of him, and he's uh, U.S. Secretary of State. And so Edward Everett is saying, hey, I'm looking at Wilkes's maps, and here's how I think we ought to phrase this. Um, and so he says, beginning at Fuca Strait, running up the strait, striking the river, he's talking about Harrow Strait here, below Vancouver Island, and then heading north up the, the main river uh, to the 49 degrees north, and um, then going inland. And that definition was approved by Daniel Webster. Yes, you may negotiate for that. Um, and he does. And that definition is how we end up as an exclave, how we are uh, in language, in written form, included within the territorial claim. Now, Edward Everett, just a little fun side note, he's uh, a Unitarian pastor. He's uh, governor of Massachusetts, senator of Massachusetts, president of Harvard in his career. Um, quite a number of uh, distinguished things. He's a detailed guy, he loves maps, he loves getting into the minutia. Daniel Webster is the orator. He's a famous American orator, famous uh, litigator and lawyer. Um, and the two had teamed up quite a bit. This was not their first go at um, the U.S. diplomatic corps in defining the border between the U.S. and, and, and Britain. Um, some may have heard of the Webster-Ashburton Treaty. Um, which defined the border around Maine, and especially between Maine and New Brunswick. That's the Webster. Uh, it also determined the boundary between through the Great Lakes and between Minnesota and Ontario. Um, so these two guys have kind of uh, been a team uh, at this kind of thing before. One final story on Edward Everett I can't resist. Um, what he's most known for, though, is none of everything I've mentioned. Um, he's most known for the Gettysburg Address. Um, so obviously the Gettysburg Address, we all think of Abraham Lincoln as giving that powerful speech, 271 words, less than two minutes. Um, well, Edward Everett, you might remember from history class, was the guy who spoke before Lincoln and took two hours. <laughs> He took 13,600 words to describe what Lincoln was able to summarize as the essentially essence of U.S. Uh, kind of uh, national character in, in two minutes. All right, so enough of those guys. I'm going to skip a whole bunch of detail about the treaty. It doesn't really pertain to Point Roberts. Let's skip ahead to June 5th, 1846. The treaty is signed. Point Roberts becomes an exclave. Um, and uh, here we are. Um, this is a, a picture of the treaty. You can read it online. It's on Wikipedia. Um, and there's a picture of the monument, and the monument clearly says Treaty of Washington on it. Um, gives us some idea of the contemporaneous view of the name of the treaty, um, at least the people who paid for the monument. But one of the big questions that we get um, in the historical society is, what's up with the name of this treaty? It says Treaty of Washington on the monument. We tend to call it the Treaty of Washington in the historical society, but a lot of people say, I thought it was the Oregon Treaty. 
right? What's the difference between the Treaty of Washington and the Oregon Treaty? Well, neither of those are correct. Both of those are just shorthand for what officially are very long titles. Um, so Britain has a copy of the treaty, the US has a copy of the treaty, they put their own title pages on their own copies of the treaty. So the treaty has multiple names, but the British title of the treaty um, is Treaty Between Her Majesty and the United States of America for the Settlement of the Oregon Boundary. So they use the word Oregon in their title. The U.S. does not. The U.S. does not refer to Oregon in the title. Um, the U.S. title of the treaty is Treaty with Great Britain in regards to limits westward of the Rocky Mountains. All that land west of the Rockies. Um, so neither of those really um, are the, what we tend to call it today. Treaty has other names. It's also sometimes known as the buchanan packenham Treaty. I don't like to use that one. This is Buchanan, the guy who eventually became President Buchanan. Uh, 15th president of the U.S., uh, not Mark's opinion, but um, presidential historians uh, tend to rank him as the worst U.S. president. Um, Still? Yeah. <laughs> not going there. Uh, the problem with the Treaty of Washington is that there's lots of treaties of Washington. That was a very popular name for treaties. Anything that's signed in Washington, D.C. is the Treaty of Washington. Um, so it's, you know, which one do you mean? Um, and then there's the Oregon Treaty. All right, but nonetheless, the treaty is signed. Point Roberts is an exclave. Um, what happened then? What was the after effect of the treaty? What happened now that Point Roberts is in an exclave? Point Roberts is within the United States. Um, what do we see happen here? Well, um, the government acknowledges, the federal government, the territorial government, that this is still unceded land. It still belongs to the Coast Salish people. It's within the United States as a country, but ownership is with the Coast Salish people. Um, what did we enter into, right? Were we in a territory? What, what did we become if you're inside the U.S.? A lot of people say we entered into Oregon Territory, and indeed most people called this Oregon Territory at the time. But legally, technically, it was not yet Oregon Territory. Oregon Territory didn't come about till 1848. So the first thing we were a part of was called the Provisional Government of Oregon. And that was our status for two years until uh, the Oregon Territory came about in 1848, and then this became Washington Territory in 1853. And slowly, more and more white settlers are coming into the Salish Sea area. Um, it's possible for someone to apply to get free 320 acres of land. There are 25 sawmills um, on the Salish Sea, the U.S. portion of the Salish Sea. And so the new governor of the Washington Territory, Governor Isaac Stevens, um, realizes he needs to have treaties with the Coast Salish people. He organizes four treaties around Washington. And the Point Elliot Treaty is the treaty that um, uh, the parties of the Coast Salish people who called this home uh, were part of. And in Article 5 of that treaty, they are guaranteed that they can continue to hunt and fish and shell fish in their usual and accustomed locations. And to the Lummi people, at least, and uh, among others, um, that's Lily Point. Um, and that's their understanding. We can still fish at Lily Point if we sign this treaty. Um, there were Coast Salish peoples from Vancouver Island who uh, also fished at Point Roberts, who are obviously not part of a U.S. treaty, um, uh, as they ended up in what is today the Canadian side of the line. So uh, this is the point at which uh, this, this treaty happens. Robertstown is the first white settlement in Point Roberts that comes around in 1857. Uh, it's sparked by the Fraser River Gold Rush, which is, was sparked here in Point Roberts. Uh, this community or this settlement was over around Freeman Beach, Waters Platte area, um, and there's a little town there. Um, whole two hours we could do just on Robertstown. Um, and in 1859, Point Roberts becomes a military reservation, right? The pig war is escalating 20 miles south of here on San Juan Island, and um, we are in that wake. Um, in, uh, and then the obelisk goes in in 1861, 
physically marking uh, monument number one on the territory. In 1870, the census shows that the Coast Salish people are still the majority in northern Washington, right? So kind of north of Mount Vernon and north plus Whidbey Island population uh, of whites is 534, Coast Salish 600 in 1870, full 15 years after the Point Elliott Treaty. Um, and indeed, the 1870s is a time of growth in Washington. Indeed, Point Roberts' first white permanent settler, John Harris, uh, arrives in that decade. And by the 1880 census, uh, the population has changed. And the white population in the same area in the northern part of the state is over 3,000. And the Coast Salish population is less than half that it was a decade prior. Um, the military reservation ends in 1884, but Point Roberts is still federal land. Uh, despite that, a number of people came here and started squatting. Um, and so you have growth in Point Roberts of non-native peoples. There's contention for resources. Um, and the Lummies sue Alaska Packers Association in 1895 saying, remember the Point Elliott Treaty. Um, Lily Point, that reef there, that's our usual and accustomed fishing ground and we were guaranteed the right to fish there. Uh, the APA had, was preventing them from um, coming ashore. The fish traps were built on the reef and the, the lemmies were having to do the reef netting behind those, not catching, uh, catching a lot of fish. So they sued APA um, over the use of that reef. Um, under their treaty protected rights. And um, that didn't, they did not prevail in that legal effort. Um, and the, the growth of Point Roberts continued. Uh, Roosevelt uh, ends the federal status in 1908 and grants land to the settlers. All right, so a little bit of post-treaty history on what happened after we attained this status as a result of the Treaty of Washington. All right. Now, let's just clear up a little bit of misinformation about Point Roberts. Um, a lot of people grew up hearing the story that, gosh, when these diplomats chose the 49th parallel as the boundary between US and Britain, that no one had been out here, no one knew there was a peninsula here. If they did, they didn't know they were cutting it off and creating an exclave. No one knew this. It was only to, when people arrived, engineers arrived to mark the border that people discovered that Point Roberts was here. Ladies and gentlemen, that is not true. That is not accurate history. That is not how we should tell the history. That did not happen. Um, and we see this a lot. Uh, here's an article from the Georgia Strait where they say, okay, they signed a treaty in 1846, and it was later the oddity of Point Roberts was discovered. No, wrong, false. And they go on and assumed the Americans would give it back, but the Americans never returned it. <laughs> I'm sorry, returned it to who? Uh, Point Roberts under treaty was never exclusively British, ever, right? From 1818 to 1846, it was jointly held, right? If we're returning Point Roberts to anyone, perhaps it's the Coast Salish who might be top of that list. Um, but no, the, the Point Roberts is not a mistake. Um, this theory is the mistake. All right. And it's with that that I conclude my talk. Uh, happy anniversary, happy birthday, Point Roberts. Uh, the Treaty of Washington, we live with it every single day to this day as an event that we are all here uh, with nothing better to do on a Saturday afternoon <laughs> than come to a history lecture. <laughs> um, but no, it's a very real force in our daily lives, in our economy, in our community, and um, it's worthy of uh, commemoration. Uh, so thank you so very much. There's refreshments inside. The History Center is open. And thanks so much for coming out today.